All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. So uh, tonight's going to be an interesting night, I think, I hope. Um, so we're going to talk about a, a sutta, so as usual. Uh, tonight's sutta is going to be the Saka Panha Sutta. The, the question of Saka, or the question of Chakra, or the question of Chakra Devanam Indra. So this is going to be an interesting night because the sutra is interesting, but I really want to have a kind of a little introductory conversation about God. <laughs> Because Chakra, Indra, the kind of the person who comes to ask the Buddha a question, is basically God. <laughs> now, it's a little more complicated than that, which is kind of what I want to get into. But I do want us to be thinking tonight, <laughs> what does it mean that God comes to ask the Buddha a question? <laughs> What does that mean? So that's sort of like the background of tonight's sutra is why would God need to ask the Buddha anything in that way? So before we get into the, the sutta, though, let's talk about chakra. Um, yeah, I mean, he appears at the very beginning of the sutta. So, so really quickly, something that we kind of need to know this particular deity, which is actually going to be an interesting choice of words, a, a, a deity, but this particular deity goes by a few different names. In the Buddhist world, the name of this entity or being, and I, I actually want to have a talk about that as well, of like, what are we talking about with this? But the name of this god in Buddhism is, and in the Pali language, is Sakkaha or Sakka. In Sanskrit, that's Chakra. Now, in more like what you might call Hinduism, like just kind of Indian religion in general, this god is usually named Indra. And then this god has a title, and the title is Devanam, the most honored one among the devas. So Devanam. Nam means like hail or praise. So the praiseworthy one of the devas. So let's actually start right there. Something that we need to know is that this particular god, Chakra Indra, is a very old Indian god. And what I mean by that is, is that rec records of this god being, they go way back. I'm talking like at least probably 2000 BC, if not much, much, much further than that. So this is a very old idea of a god. Now, one of the things that we want to keep in mind, within the world of Indian cosmology, I guess you might call it, there are these beings, a, a class of beings or a group of beings that are called devas, D-E-V-A, a deva. Now, this particular word deva is important. Now, the first thing that I want to make clear is that Indra, chakra Indra, is a deva. And there's a way in which, at least if you kind of go digging around in the historical record, there seems to be a way in which 
Indra is the deva. And then there's sort of lesser devas. Now, the reason why I'm kind of emphasizing the role of the deva is because that word, that Sanskrit word, deva, it's where we get the English word divine, but ultimately, if you start digging deeper, it's where we get the English word deity. But if you go digging even deeper, there's a word in, well, not so much in English exactly, although it is in the word like deity and, and a diva, right? But ultimately, there's a word that is the Latin word for God, this idea of, of the dios, like in Spanish, adios, go with God. So that word, dios, dio, where we get the theo of theology, all of those English words that come from the Gre uh, Greco-Latin roots, all of those words that have the root D-E-I, day, come from this Sanskrit root deva. So what I'm getting at is, is that etymologically, our Western concept of God <laughs> through this genealogy that I kind of just mapped out very roughly, our Western idea of God in that way can be stemmed back to this kind of Indian tradition. Because let's remember the Greeks get it all from India. The Romans get it all from the Greeks who got it all from India. So all of this kind of God culture is pretty old. And there's much more to this. Indra, Chakra Indra, the, the kind of the star of tonight's Dharma doors. Indra is the God of the sky the god of weather, the god of war, the god of kind of, well, I'll say more about that. But what I want to point out is that there is this idea of a sky god. And this sky god wields a thunderbolt. This is chakra, this is Indra. But what I'm getting at is that this idea, this imagination of a sky god who holds a, a, a lightning bolt, well, that's where, or that is related to another sky god who wields a lightning bolt. And that is the Greek god, Zeus. But what you may not know is that the name Zeus, Zeus, is actually just a pronunciation of Dios. That's right. The word Zeus actually means God or Deus. <laughs> and so what I'm piecing together is, is that there is this tradition of a sky god that holds a thunderbolt that's the god of war and weather. And in India, they call that god Indra or Chakra. In the, in the Greek-speaking world, they call it Zeus. In the more kind of uh, Nordic, the Norris mythology, they call this same god Thor. Thor also holds a, a lightning bolt. And there's another interesting etymology to all of this. The day of the week... Tuesday, well, the two, like T-E-U, Tuesday, is actually Dew's Day, which is the same Dios, because that Tuesday was a day to the war sky god, and I can't pronounce it in the kind of the uh, kind of original language, but it's all related 
to this idea of a deva, to a deity, to the divine. So there's all of this kind of this world of a sky god, war god. Now, what happens is, is this. Ah, interestingly, if you don't know this, um, you, you might find this interesting. In the Islamic tradition, in Saudi Arabia, at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, there were a lot of kind of, um, I guess you would call them gods or spirits, but there's a word in Arabic for a god spirit being. And that word is L-A-H, basically. La. And then among all of the laws, among all of the spirits, eventually the Islamic tradition identified one of those. The La. And in Arabic, that is Al-La. The La. Like the top La is the al la. Allah, that's the what the word Allah means, means the ultimate top la. That's exactly what happens with Chakra Indra, who's a deva, but gets elevated to being the top of the devas. So this is Chakra Devanam Indra, the king of the devas. The reason why I'm pointing all of this out is, is that kind of from a a more kind of anthropological view of this. And if you don't know this, if, if anybody out there doesn't know this, of course, my background is as kind of like history of religion. I only sort of drifted into specifying into Buddhism much later in my life, but I started by studying kind of all of different forms of religion. So I look at these things a little more anthropologically, culturally. And what you find is this same kind of uh, thing. If the same thing happens in the Hebrew tradition too, where there's a bunch of different deities, but one of them gets elevated to the level of the ultimate deity. So it happens in the Islamic tradition, happens in the Jewish tradition, it happens in the kind of Indian Hindu tradition as well, except in the Indian tradition, it's a little more complicated because, mm, well, I can't really say this categorically across the board, but in India, the Indian culture, Indian cosmology, it remains rather polytheistic, meaning there's kind of multiple gods. And even though I was just saying that Chakra Indra is like the head of the gods or like king of the gods, Indra is not the only god in town, put it that way. So, and by the way, all of this is for a reason. We, we, we really need to understand who Chakra is before we can talk about this sutra. Like why... Why is this conversation even happening? Well, here's the thing about chakra. You need to understand one important thing about Indian philosophy or cosmology, which then becomes part of Buddhist cosmology. What it is is that it is a standard, a very, very basic standard part of Indian Buddhist cosmology that there are kind of three primary realms or dimensions to reality. We talk about them a lot on in Dharma doors. So we need to understand that there is what is known as the Kama Dattu, the realm of desire, and basically, that's kind of like the realm of our projections, basically sort of projecting onto the world, 
all of our wants, all of our desires, our aesthetics, our values, our morals. So there's a, a way in which we are projecting a lot of meaning out onto the world in that way. And that's kind of the realm of desire, the realm of the, the, the desirable. Kind of underneath that, underneath all of that psychic projection is what is known as the realm of form, the realm of just the elements, the realm of just physics. No particular meaning or significance or value or aesthetic, just matter interacting with other matter. <laughs> That's the realm of form. And then there's, of course, the formless realm. No visible form. No, it's not tangible. It's sort of a, a formless realm of mind, kind of. So those are the three realms. What happens in Indian and Buddhist cosmology is that within the realm of desire, there's a hierarchy and that hierarchy of desire sitting at the top of that hierarchy is Chakra Devanam Indra. In other words, Chakra is considered the god or the king of the realm of desire. There's another god, though. That god is named or usually known as Brahma. Brahma is the god of the realm of form. Brahma is often considered or called the creator god within Indian Buddhist cosmology. Because Brahma basically kind of works with the elements, Brahma is like the fabricator, creator of the physical realm. But then human beings, and actually not just human beings, by the way, but all kind of creatures, start to project all of their kind of psychodramas onto the realm of form. And that starts to basically create this realm of desire and Indra is the king or the ruler of that realm. Now, who's kind of top dog? Brahma or, or you know, Brahma or Indra? Well, the point is, is there's not a top dog they have different realms that they are uh, overlords of. By the way, the third realm that we talked about, the formless realm, in some traditions, there is a god of that formless realm, and it, that god is usually named Maheshvara, the, the great sovereign one. But there's a kind of a funny thing that goes on with the formless realm, though. And the thing about the formless realm is it's formless. <laughs> and so it's not really possible for this body of form to go anywhere near the formless realm. There's no way for Michael as a differentiated entity, there's really no way for Michael to get into the formless realm because I'd have to <laughs> leave the form behind in the realm of pure form in that way. What I'm getting at is, is that what eventually happens is that the third, fo that formless realm kind of becomes the realm of the meditator. And what I mean is, is that the general kind of idea of both Indian and Buddhist cosmology, it's the idea that if, if you can get into the realm of, or if you can get into the formless realm, you are God. 
that's the idea is that it is total freedom and so there you are tantamount to a god in that way so that's a kind of a tricky realm the formless realm and again it's tricky because there's no form there so we don't have a lot to to go on in that way let's just leave the formless realm <laughs> to the formless Let's go back to talking about the realm of desire. So the reason why I kind of gave us this long introduction to Indra is so that we could come to understand, ah, Indra is this, you know, again, king of desire, of the realm of desire. Now, we got to pull this back a little bit because I, well, I got to have mentioned something. We need to talk about the idea of does Indra exist? And what you know what I mean? It's like, is Indra real? And one part of us is thinking maybe more like, I don't know traditionally might be the word where a god is like you know i don't know uh, uh an anthropomorphized being right well what i'm getting at is is that there are of course people both way back at the time of the buddha and even people today there's people that sort of believe in these gods but in like, you know, that they really, really, really exist. Okay, I'm, I'm fine with that. But what I want to talk about, though, is there's also sort of a, a extreme view in the other direction, which is like a categorical denial of the existence of such things as spirits, deities, gods, and what have you. That's all just whatever. <laughs> so those are our kind of two extreme views using the Buddhist expression, which is that we either kind of believe in the in Indra, the god of the realm of desire, or we don't believe in the existence of Indra, god of the realm of desire. One of the things to think about, though, in regards to this is, so... The thing to think about with Indra as the god of the realm of desire, that means that Indra, or it doesn't mean this, but it, it comes to mean that Indra basically, in terms of the mythology of Indra, let's put it this way. Indra is known for having many, many wives and having a lot, a lot of sex. In other words, there is a side of Indra that is very sensual, very sexual, very sexually active in that way. But I also mentioned that Indra is the god of war, which also means Indra is very much a, a god of anger, and he is often throwing lightning bolts and smoting people. So he basically represents this kind of um, bipolarity of the emotions where he's like extreme passion and extreme anger. And he embodies that. Now, what I'm getting at is, is Well, I mentioned this idea of these two extreme views, that either Indra exists, or that's crazy, Indra doesn't exist. But let me ask you this. Does anger exist? <laughs> the idea here is, is that that's like kind of a, a tricky question in a way, because it's like... It, you would be hard pressed to deny the existence of anger. But 
but where is anger? Like, can you, can you, could you, could you like put it in a box and send it to me? Like, what is anger? And of course, it's one of those things where it's like, well, I'll know it when I see it, right? But what I'm getting at is, is that in terms of the realm of desire, which includes anger and the passions and emotions and all of that, what I'm getting at is, is that that's a very subtle realm already, not even talking about a God of that realm, but just that actual realm of sensuality and all of that is rather tricky. And so what I'm kind of pointing out is, is kind of a middle path option for if there is this passion, lust, anger, if there are all of those things, then there can kind of be this idea of, of their ultimate, their essence in that way. And that would be Indra. That would be Chakra Indra, the essence of sensuality, the essence essence of anger and the passions, the essence of all of that. And the point again is, is that if you believe that those things exist, then there's sort of the essence of those things. A lot like, by the way, not unlike, there's another world of religion. And in particular, I'm thinking of Krishna, that also a Hindu Indian god, Krishna, which has a lot of relationship with the, um, the kind of Christian god, this kind of Jesus. And what I mean is, is that both Chris Krishna and Christ are considered these embodiments of love. Like the, like what is, what is Krishna? Krishna is love and not, not sensual lust, love, but like love, love, love. And the point is, is that, do you believe in love? If you believe in love, then you believe in Krishna because Krishna is love. So if there's love in the world, Krishna's in the world. If you're with me on that, with like kind of anthropomorphizing love as Krishna or Jesus or what have you, Indra is the sort of personification of, again, the passions of the realm of desire. Does Indra exist? I don't know. That's the kind of a few different ways to think about this Indra person. Okay. Any questions before we get to the sutra? Any just background questions about God? <laughs> Indra, chakra, anything I just talked about? Any just curiosities before we get to like the Dharma? Uh, good. Because that's all kind of anecdotal in that way. I know, no. <laughs> okay. So again, oh, one last thing though, because I do want you to kind of have a visual image. I mentioned at the very beginning, I mentioned that Indra, Chakra Indra is a, this really, really, really old Indian God, right? Like, Again, thousands of years, probably before the Buddha. Indra, being the god of the sky, being the god of weather, carries this lightning bolt weapon that I mentioned. And you should know that that lightning bolt weapon is a Vajra. And the Vajra is, of course, very associated with the Buddhist tradition. You, it even branches into its own type of Buddhism that you might know of, the Vajrayana. 
what everybody should know though is that the vajra symbol in the world of buddhism it's coming by way of chakra devanam indra so that's the kind of a connection there by the way just really interestingly this very ancient indian god as we're going to see in a moment becomes part of the buddhist tradition and kind of becomes part of the buddhist family in india then via the buddhist tradition buddhism moves to east asia moves to china eventually moves to japan and they bring buddhism brings with it the indian pantheon with all of these different deities and then eventually this now kind of buddhist personage indra goes to japan and in japan there's a really famous buddhist temple called the sanju sanjendo the temple of the 33 and it's this um it's this very famous hall in um i think it's in kyoto and so these are all statues of abhilokiteshvara there's many 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 of them with one giant central statue of abhilokiteshvara but also surrounding abhilokiteshvara are all of these other Buddhist personages. And one of them is this person who is Chakra Devanam Indra. Now you might notice that Chakra has what looks like a kind of a CD in his hand on his finger. So this is actually, I mean, this is a CD, but if you see that image, that's a kind of stylized Vajra. It's a Vajra disc versus the Vajra bolt. But what I really would love for you to notice about this image is notice that Indra's wearing a kimono. This is one of the most, for me personally, like in terms of art history, this is one of the most fascinating statues in the world because this is a like, a medieval like Kamakura period. So we're talking like 1200, 1300 Japanese statue of this ancient Indian weather god and they've put him in a kimono. I, I just think that this is the most interesting like culture clash ever in that way. So it just shows you that this deity, this god figure, becomes a very important part of the Buddhist tradition. But why? <laughs> Let's find out. So we are still reading from the Samyutta Nikaya. So the big book of the connected discourses. We are still in section 35, which is the section on the Sad Ayatana, the six sense bases. We're moving to a new section, though, of this portion. And this portion is called the Loka Kamagunya Samyutta. The connected discourses on worlds, sensual desire, or I guess it's different gunas, different types of worlds and sensual desires. That's what this section is about. I'm skipping over the first few of the sutras in this section and jumping right to this one. And this one again is just called the uh, Saka Panha, the question, the Panha of Saka. So, oh, and I'm on page 1192. If you happen to have the big book, this is going to be, uh, yep. Yeah. Sutta number five. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Rajagaha, 
on Mount Vulture's Peak. Then Sukka, Lord of the Devas, approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, stood to one side, and said to him, Venerable Sir, what is the cause and the reason why some beings here do not attain nirvana in this very life? And what is the cause and the reason why some beings here attain nirvana in this very life? The Buddha replied, There are, Lord of the Devas, visible forms cognizable by the eye that are desirable, lovely, agreeable, pleasing, sensually enticing, tantalizing. If a bhikkhu, if a practitioner, seeks delight in them, welcomes them, and remains holding on to them, that bhikkhu's consciousness becomes dependent upon them and clings to them. A bhikkhu with clinging does not attain nirvana. There are, Lord of the Devas, sounds cognizable by the ear that are desirable, lovely, agreeable, pleasing, sensually enticing, and tantalizing, if a bhikkhu seeks delight in those sounds, welcomes them, and remains holding on to them, their consciousness becomes dependent upon those sounds and clings to them. A bhikkhu with clinging does not attain nirvana. There are, Lord of the Devas, scents cognizable by the nose, flavors, cognizable by the tongue, tactile objects cognizable by the body, and thoughts cognizable by the mind. Thoughts that are desirable, lovely, agreeable, pleasing, sensually enticing, and tantalizing. If a bhikkhu seeks delight in them, welcomes them, and remains holding on to them, their consciousness becomes dependent upon them and clings to them. A bhikkhu with clinging does not attain nirvana. This is the cause. This is the reason, Lord of the Devas, why some beings here do not attain nirvana in this very life. There are, Lord of the Devas, Visible forms cognizable by the eye that are desirable, lovely, agreeable, pleasing, sensually enticing, and tantalizing, and so on, all the way up to there being mental phenomena cognizable by the mind that are desirable, lovely, agreeable, pleasing, sensually enticing, tantalizing. If a bhikkhu does not seek delight in them, does not welcome them, and does not remain holding to them. Their consciousness does not become dependent upon them or cling to them. A bhikkhu without clinging attains nirvana. This is the cause. This is the reason, Lord of the Devas, why some beings here attain nirvana in this very life. Okay. So let's go through that a little bit. So the first thing that I kind of want to point out, if you didn't notice it, this is the section of the Samyutta Nikaya that's dealing with the six senses. Last week we read a sutra, or actually read three suttas, I think, dealing with the six senses. But this began, I think, the week before that, when I read also from the section on the six senses, but I read the famous fire sermon sutra, the Aditya Paraya Sutta. So this fire sutra 
is kind of one of the most famous, if not the most famous of the suttas or the teachings on the six senses. And the, the gist of that, like to put it to you simply, the Buddha says to the bhikkhus, bhikkhus, the eyes are on fire. <laughs> Why? Because they are burning with desire desire for visible forms and then he says the ears are on fire burning with desire for sounds the nose the tongue the body and the brain are burning they are burning with desire i wanted to remind you of that that kind of teaching about the fire sermon or that upaya that metaphor that the buddha uses speaking about the senses being on fire so I wanted to mention that because tonight we're going to talk about a very related topic, nirvana. So let's kind of go through this sort of just paragraph by paragraph. The first thing I think that we should talk about is the idea of nirvana. It's the reason why I actually wanted to, to read this sutta. I know that this idea of nirvana is like, you know, ooh, nirvana. You know, it has such mystique around it in that way. And I think that there's a way in which <laughs> defining nirvana is very easy. Achieving nirvana, <laughs> maybe a little more difficult in that way. My, my point is, is that I don't think there's any real mystery over what nirvana indicates or what it means. In fact, this is the, this is chakra's question. So the first thing that I want to kind of draw our attention to regarding this is chakra's question is, hey, Buddha, why isn't everybody just getting into nirvana? What's what's the deal? Why are some of these people getting it and some people aren't? That's chakra's question. Now, this idea of some beings here attaining nirvana in this very life. So right away, that's a very important message of Buddhism there's several sutras. There's some of my favorite sutras or suttas because they're early teachings. And it's a it's the Buddha discoursing with these other religions or at least leaders of these other religions. And it's the idea that everything that they're promising, everything that they're teaching is about your next life. Everything is about the future. And the Buddha says, yeah, yeah, yeah. What I'm teaching, it's about right here and right now. This is not about next life. This is about the ending of suffering right here and right now. I think that that's a really important message of Buddhism. There's several important messages tonight. The first is this idea of the the realizability of nirvana, if you will. I think it's a really important thing about Buddhism that it doesn't have this like pie in the sky, next life, just hold on, don't worry about this, like you'll get there. There's much more of a, a greater promise of something happening right here and right now. And I think that that's an important part of Buddhism. Now let's talk about this word Nibbana. So of course, in the Pali language, it's Nibbana. In the Sanskrit, Nirvana. If you haven't heard this, and I would imagine everybody here tonight has heard this and knows this, but the word Nirvana means to blow out. Just like a candle flame, they say, to niban is to pss, 
to blow out the candle flame. What I, the reason why I wanted to remind you of the fire sermon sutra <laughs> is because the Buddha talks about the various sense organs all being on fire with desire. And so the idea is, is that that fire can be put out, can be nibbaned, can be nirvanad. And so there's this really interesting relationship between the fire sermon and this teaching of nirvana or this idea of nirvana. So in this particular sutra, nirvana is being equated with this ceasing of the craving of the six sense organs, the, the putting out of that craving in that way. So that's going to be our nirvana. That's what we're going to be kind of getting at tonight. So let's kind of start going down the list here of what the Buddha tells chakra. So another very important part that I want to make really clear that I think is interesting about the wording of this sutta. The Buddha says that there, there are Lord of the Devas, forms, rupa, visible forms, cognizable by the eye, that are desirable, that are lovely, that are agreeable, that are pleasing, that are sensually enticing, and that are tantalizing. So, the one thing, actually, let me finish this paragraph, then we'll talk about it in more detail. Given that, that there are visible forms that are agreeable, pleasing, and so on, the Buddha says, if a bhikkhu seeks delight in them, welcomes them, and remains holding on to them, their consciousness becomes dependent upon them and clings to them. And a bhikkhu with clinging, does not attain nirvana. And then it does that for sounds, scents, smells, tactile objects in the mind. So the first thing that I kind of want to make really clear is that Buddhism, the Buddha, recognizes that there are things to be seen in this world that are visibly pleasing that are visibly delightful, that are visibly, you know, agreeable in that way. And my point is, is this, the Buddha isn't denying that these things are agreeable or pleasing in that way. I know that might sound like a, a even like, why are you even saying that? But the point is, is that when we, and I do want to talk about equanimity tonight, the idea of, of kind of being equanimous. But the idea here is, is that that equanimity, that equality is not blind to the pleasing nature of things, nor is it blind to the displeasing nature of some things in that way. So I want to make that clear that the, the sutra is really clear that, yeah, there's things to be seen in this world that are pleasing and agreeable and all of that. But here's the problem. If a bhikkhu seeks delight in them, all right? So this is that, I think, what was this? This was uh, abhinandati, ananda, pleasure, joy, delight. And then this abhi, abhi nandati, seeking delight in them. So this is an idea, or this is a kind of a teaching that I am often talking about. I, for me, this is like the most important like thing about the Dharma. It's not about a, a visible form 
meeting the eye and there being something pleasing about that. That's, that's whatever that can happen. The really important thing to notice that the Buddha is talking about is it's a problem when the bhikkhu, when the practitioner seeks delight in visible forms or in sounds or in smells, flavors, tactile objects, or thoughts. And this is what I'm kind of always describing. If you come to Dharma doors, you've heard this from me a lot, but I'm always talking about the difference between, um, you know, let's say somebody has, um, let me, let me, uh, uh, let's do flavors, right? So let's say, you know, somebody has a whatever, uh, some ice cream, whatever it is, whatever, you know, whatever flavor. And if somebody says, oh, you want to try this? It's really good. And you're like, okay, ooh, that is really good. So that would be a flavor cognizable by the tongue that is agreeable, pleasing, and so on. There's a big difference between the unexpected experience where somebody's like, hey, try this. It's good. And you're like, okay. There's a big difference between that and sitting, let's say, uh, I, I bet you could imagine this really happening. Imagine one night you're thinking, you know what would be good? ice cream or whatever, whatever, whatever. And now you're thinking or you're feeling even, I'm not going to be able to be happy tonight until we get some ice cream. Now you're seeking delight in a flavor. You're putting all of your delight is now riding on this whole ice cream situation. And what I want you to notice is, is that as soon as you do that, as soon as you decide, I'm not gonna be able to be happy tonight until there's some ice cream around, you have created the conditions now for your own terrible evening. <laughs> you are now going to not have a good evening provided you don't get the, the, the ice cream in that way. So my point is, is that this sutra uses language very specifically, and it's talking about the seeking of delight in visible objects, in sounds, in smells, flavors, and so on. The seeking of them. Again, it's not about the, hey, try this, it's good, and you having a pleasant experience. All right? Now, I'll have more to say about that because it might be that somebody says, ooh, this is really good. You should try it. And you're like, okay, ooh, that is really good. I'm never going to be able, able to be happy again ever until I have more of that. <laughs> so now that is the seeking delight in it because now you've said, ah, I can't be happy until I have more of that. And now there is what the Buddha talks about in terms of the welcoming of it and the clinging to it in that way. So that's another, so the first thing the Buddha talks about is that a bhikkhu seeking delight in visible forms, sounds, flavors, and so on. And what I want you to notice is, is that the mind that is seeking the delight can't be delighted because it's created this condition of no, not until that, not until that. But notice the mind that then isn't doing that. And I guess I'm getting ahead of myself in terms of the sutra, but the mind that's not doing that can be delighted right now. But the mind that has decided, no, 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 not until the ice cream arrives. That mind has put itself in that compromised suffering position. 
until the ice cream arrives. But then once the ice cream's all gone, oh, right? Okay, so that's the idea of the seeking delight in. Then, of course, there's this language of welcoming, welcoming it, and then clinging to it. So if a bhikkhu seeks delight in, say, visible forms, welcomes them, and remains holding to them, that's what we want to now focus on, is the remain holding on to them. I probably haven't told, I haven't told this story. It just came to mind. If you haven't heard this story, you have to hear this story. It's like obligatory, but it's a great, it's a great story though. And it has a lot to do with this. It, it's a Zen story. So it comes from the Chinese Zen tradition, but what it is, is it's, it's a great story about the classic setup, teacher, student, elder monk, the teacher, the young acolyte, right? Following behind the teacher, right? So teacher and student are walking along one day and they come to a small like creek and they see that there's a woman there who is nervously trying to cross the creek. She's got some, some bags of stuff that she's trying not to get wet and so the teacher, the master, goes up, takes her by the arm, and helps her across the creek. Now, as they move on, the teacher and the student, the student is shook. <gasps> and you know why he's so shook? <gasps> Because his teacher just broke a major precept. Within the Buddhist tradition, if you have taken complete monastic vows, you're not actually supposed to touch members of the opposite sex. That's part of the rules. That you're not supposed to touch. If you're a monk, you're not supposed to touch a woman. If you're a nun, you're not supposed to touch a man. Just part of the rules. So the young student knowing these rules is speechless because he just watched his teacher break a rule so they're going on they're going on and a few miles down the road the student is like master i i, I have to say something I, but how could you do that and he and the, the teacher goes do what and the and the student says you held that woman by the river. You took hold of her and you held her across the river. And the teacher says, yeah, I did. And it sounds like you're still holding on to her. So that's kind of a Zen, classic Zen story about holding on to these things. And that's sort of another thing that I was getting across with. If somebody is like, ooh, this ice cream is so good. I'd try some. And you tasted it and you were like, you know what? That, that was so, that's so delightful. Again, there's a way in which the mind could then become obsessed with getting another bite. Or just obsessed with that flavor. Or there's a mind that experiences the joyful sensation, but then doesn't cling or hold on to that experience in that way. So we want to notice the kind of the subtleties of dealing with sensual experiences in that way and sort of the, the various ways that Buddhism can approach it in that sense. Okay. Anybody all doing good questions? So if a bhikkhu seeks delight in sensual pleasures and welcomes them and remains holding on to them, what happens? Their consciousness 
becomes dependent upon them and clings to them. So those are two different things right there. The vijnana, so the consciousness, excuse me, the consciousness becomes dependent upon them and then clings to them. So the idea here is, is that we want to, and I've been talking about it, I've already mentioned it several times tonight. We want to be aware of those kinds of mental dependencies, or I should even say sensual dependencies. Also, I, I should mention this too, really quickly, because I've been I've been kind of glossing through this a little too quickly. So the Buddha is talking about visible forms, delightful to the eye, pleasing to the eye, right? So what we want to, because when we're talking about the six senses, we really want to be aware of the difference between seeing something and it being visually pleasing versus thinking of something and it being mentally pleasing. And what I mean by that is when we're talking about visible forms that are pleasing to the eye, remember that it's the mind that would well let me uh, let me grab my classic example <laughs> when it comes to form remember that it's the mind that's going to sort of ascribe names because it's the mind that works in language so names Ideas like faces, cups, all of that is the realm of the mind. The eyes are doing the discerning of visible form. And so it's probably, it would probably be a little more accurate to think of like, so I'll give you like a, a few examples, but you ever you ever go into like a really really brightly lit grocery store and it like hurts your eyes like the the particular like fluorescent bright bulbs and it's so many of them often in a supermarket it can be like harsh on the eyes but then imagine like the light of a sunset that like golden really pleasing wonderful light and then you could imagine like kind of total darkness so what i'm getting at is is that when we're talking about the eyes and visible forms and whether they are pleasing or not we need to be thinking about it at a very kind of rudimentary level of are the eyes opening to to try to get more or are the eyes kind of closing because they want less oh like the the, the light is too bright so my eyes close because they don't want any more they have aversion they have aversion to the light or it might be that whatever it is that i'm look that the light sort of is so hypnotic that the eyes are like you know totally captivated by the the visible form same thing with sounds it could be too loud right and then that would not be pleasing to the ears if it were so loud or it could be like you know super sonorous beautiful but not beautiful because of the mind just on the ears and then the ears would like 
want to hear more of that. Or if, if the sound was really pleasant, like imagine being on a beach and it's the ocean waves, shh, shh, right? It's very pleasing. And then all of a sudden a tsunami warning and the your ears would not like it. Your mind wouldn't like it either because your mind would be thinking, uh-oh, I got to get out of here. But that would be the mind having a bad reaction to what it thinks is going on in that way. So I just wanted to kind of make that clear in terms of like really focusing on like, is it my eyes that want more of this? Is it my tongue that wants more of this salty, these salty chips? Or is it my mind because I'm bored? But notice that those are two different things. The actual salivary glands wanting more salt versus a kind of mind that is bored that wants something to do. Two different kind of things. And this is about kind of noticing that of all six senses. So in other words, we want to be aware of when we are, um, when we are seeking delight for the eyes or the ears or the nose or the tongue or the body, or when we are seeking delight for the brain mind in that way. And then similarly, it could be the eyes that become clinging to and attached to something. It could be the mouth, it could be the ears, it could be, or it could be the mind that becomes attached to these things. Now, the Buddha is saying that if this starts to happen, vijnana becomes dependent upon those senses and clings to them. I often use in a lot of my Dharma talks, you know, I often talk about, or I use the, it's not an analogy, but, you know, I compare a lot of the Buddhist teachings to teachings about addiction and recovery. And that's because for me, Buddhism is basically saying, and we're reading a sutra that's talking about it. We're all kind of addicted to sensuality. And what I mean, what I mean by addicted to it is we kind of basic, or many of us, I know I'm in this category, we feel like we need it. We're dependent upon it. We're dependent upon watching stuff or we're dependent upon listening to stuff or we're dependent upon smelling things or tasting things or touching things or being touched or we're addicted to mental activity. And the idea of this is that if you try to meditate and you actually try to shut it all down, like, you know, a good meditation where you kind of shut it all down, it's when you realize how addicted all this body is to sensual things. It starts with boredom and then it turns into getting up and not meditating because I have to go watch something, listen to something, eat something, smell something, touch something, or I need to at least think about something. So we want to notice a sort of like, basically a kind of addiction, a dependency on sensual stimulation. Now, I know that you know, I've mentioned it before, there are, in the very early forms of Buddhism, there are some pretty hardcore forms of early Buddhism. And I haven't mentioned this before, but since I've been talking about like history or like kind of more like more ancient Indian traditions, I do want you to know that, well, that basically like there is this more hardcore version of Buddhism that is like promoting total sensual uh, 
like cutting off all sensuality. I kind of don't think that that's the true Dharma. I think that's kind of extreme in that way. My understanding of the Dharma, and it's because of like reading these sutras, the Buddhist sort of seems to be very focused on this idea of seeking delight in these things, becoming dependent upon them and clinging to them. I don't find anywhere though, actually, I don't find anywhere a kind of like avoid pleasure. It's more about not seeking it and not being dependent upon it in that way. So, and then of course, this all ends with this idea of the consciousness becomes dependent upon sensualities and then clings to them. And we know that that's the problem. Upadana, clinging. That's what the Buddha is talking about in terms of where the suffering's coming from. Actually, the suffering's coming from the desire that leads to the clinging, but it's that very clinging that is producing the suffering in that sense. So we're just identifying where this is coming from in that way. All right. And of course, all of this goes for not just for visible forms, but for all six sense objects in that way. And then we are told very simply, and the bhikkhu who does not seek delight in these things, the bhikkhu who does not welcome them, does not remain holding to them, their consciousness doesn't become dependent upon them, and therefore they don't cling to them. And a bhikkhu without clinging attains nirvana. So, I said it earlier, and I kind of want to reiterate it. I don't think that nirvana is that mysterious or that hard to define. I do think it's hard to achieve such a state, <laughs> which is this state where in terms of everything that you're seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and thinking about, the mind not clinging to them, not being dependent upon them. So then the practice, basically for me personally, becomes about noticing when I am doing that. A, I try to notice when I say to myself, like, and it, it happens all the time, but whatever it is, but it's the idea of like, um, uh, you know, we were going to watch that movie tonight. The idea that, ah, I'm going to be happy because we're going to watch that movie tonight. And then it's not available. It's not streaming. Well, there's a mind that can be like, great, what else are we going to watch? What, or what else is going on? <laughs> or there's the mind that was dependent upon it being that movie tonight. And again, all we want to notice as practitioners is that if you're in that situation where you're so upset because the movie's not streaming, just recognize that you're creating your own suffering. <laughs> it's not Netflix. It's not Amazon. Nobody's doing it to you. You've created the conditions under which you've decided you would be happy. <laughs> And now you're not getting the conditions that you've predetermined would make you happy and it's making you upset. That's the Dharma. That's the Dharma. And so we could keep pointing and blaming other people or we just notice, oh, I've created the conditions for this. I've set up the standards for what happiness will be tonight in that way.
So the first thing I notice is when I've set my own, like call it an expectation up in that way. When I've decided like, you know, um, whatever it is, maybe it's that last, that last bite of ice cream that's in the refrigerator, that's in the freezer. And I'm thinking tonight I'm going to have it and it's going to make me so happy. And then I go and open the refrigerator and somebody ate it already. So it's gone. I can blame the person that ate it and say, you're the problem. You're causing me suffering because you ate the last piece of ice cream that I was going to eat. But that would be ignorant. That would not be recognizing that you created the category for what would make the happiness. So again, for me, it's a practice of, of observing, observing when I've set up these expectations for what I think would make happiness and then noticing if they don't play out that way, how things make me feel. Then we have the one version where I am planning on it being that thing like my last bite of ice cream, but then it's gone. So there's that version that the Buddha is talking about in terms of um, seeking delight in, but then there's the other side of it, which is once we've had the exposure, there's like the now clinging on to it in that way versus what I was kind of trying to describe before, which is sort of the more experiences come, experiences go. And there's a mind that's going to maybe hold on to that or try to hold on to that. Or there's a mind that's liberated in that sense. That's not going to do that. Okay. Questions, ideas, comments? Yeah, no. I don't know if I'm going to be able to describe this, but I feel like for me, there's more of a subtle clinging to sensual pleasure, which is like an avoidance of the dullness or boredom or difficulty. It's, it's almost like this uh, unconscious turning toward yeah, just engaging in things that are not even that pleasurable. <laughs> you know, like I don't know, playing a stupid game or eating something when you're not really hungry would be would be two examples of that. Mm -hmm. That yeah, it's a little more subtle than what you're describing, but I feel like that's kind of where I am in my practice. <clears throat> even no and, and I don't even notice it, you know, because it's just mm -hmm. so habitual. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, Noam, because I did want to mention sort of hmm, basically kind of regarding this idea of, of achieving nirvana. I want to kind of point out, yeah, that there's levels to this as far as there's like, you know, some really gross overt levels, which, you know, might even be, you know, neuroses and like really like serious stuff. And then there's sort of more of the subtle layer. And a lot of a lot of you out there that are practitioners, you may have in a way already sort of dealt with a lot of the more manifest gross level stuff, but are then beginning to recognize that there's a whole world of kind of more latent things underneath. And so nirvana is when all of that is cleared out. And that could be a long process in that sense. So, yeah, Renata. I was thinking in the case of desire, what if somebody um, uh, leads you on and misrepresents himself? And, um, it, you know, I mean, you really weren't out for it in the first place. Um, yeah, I think regardless, we would need to be very mindful of where. You know, um, Renata, you might be familiar with this, maybe not. Very classic example. A super classic example of this coming out of India. It's not exactly Buddhist, although the Buddhists do use this. 
And it's basically the analogy of the uh, the chariot and the five horses, sometimes six horses, depending. And the horses represent the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body. And then maybe there's six horses or maybe the brain is the chair the, at the, the helm. But the metaphor is about how for many of us, the horses are driving the chariot, meaning that we're just along for the ride and our eyes are like, ooh, what's that? Wait, what was that? Ooh, that smells good. Ooh, what's that over there? And so the horses are just driving the chariot. And so it's a classic metaphor of kind of yoga and meditation that this whole process is about getting control of the senses so that we can be like, no, 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 horses. We're going over there now. And the whole chariot goes at once. Not one's going this way, one's going that way. So Renata, I think regardless of kind of, you know, whatever the intentions of other people are, or what have you, we want to be aware of when, when we are out of control and just being driven by our senses versus when we are driving our senses in that sense. <laughs> Lane, question? Thank you, Michael. Um, I I liked the way you were talking about um, our dependency on these maybe objects or habits or whatever. Definitely feel that in myself. Um, and I, but I feel dependent, and you know, and they it seems like oh they're benign, but but I am really, you know, I really can't give up that morning cup of coffee. I really can't, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but then I think. You know, anyone that's known true addiction knows the only way out is abstinence, is total abstinence, right? So I understand the draw of early Buddhism to renounce everything. I, I kind of relate to it. And every time we have these Dharma doors, I always think to myself, man, I got to get rid of these eyes. I, you know, I just got to gouge out my eyes or something like these senses, they're just doing me in. But I just, I don't know. Can you speak to a balance? I don't know. Between, because we do like, you know, if you're an alcoholic, like, yeah, you actually can't ever get yourself in hand and walk away from the drink. You really have to be abstinent from the drink. So, but what about all this other stuff that we're mm -hmm. trying to balance, you know, like foods and whatever, entertainment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great question. So regarding coffee. <laughs> yeah. So I do think that there is the renunciatory path. There is such a path. And it's why I'm not a monk. My point is, is that is one path, which is just put it all down. But there is a householder path. And, and it's not even a householder path. There's this bodhisattva path that's sort of just a little different. So from somebody who loves coffee, I think that the the what I would kind of say to that tonight is it's really, it's not about having a cup of coffee in the morning. It's about that morning when you're out of coffee. That's the time to practice. In terms of noticing any kind of, you know, uh, being upset, being whatever, being angry about it, and asking yourself, really, I can't just have tea this morning? Like, it has to be coffee? Like, to use that moment that would otherwise be kind of disappointing and, and anger producing, to use that moment to practice, that for me is what being a kind of householder practice is about. Not giving up the coffee, but having a, a healthy kind of practitioner relationship with it in that sense of, A, if I don't 
have coffee, noticing the reactions. And if you wanted to do like a, a bonus round, <laughs> actually enjoying the coffee, but noticing that enjoyment. Like, you know, it's really important to meditate on the good stuff as much as the bad stuff in that way. So my point is, is just to use it as, use all of this as moments of practice if you're not going to make this radical renunciatory path choice. I will, though, say this, though. This is initially what I wrote down, though, in response to your question, Lane. I re And hear me out on this. I hear you about abstinence, like Lane, what you said about that. I totally hear you. But I actually think that, how could I put this? It's not about abstaining from, um, I, what I want to say simply is, is that it's, we should be abstaining from craving not abstaining from the coffee exactly, but abstaining from the craving and the needing of it. And I actually think that that's kind of true in that way. Like in, in that sense that, yeah, that I really think that there is this middle path that the Buddha is always talking about, that it isn't about these extremes of like giving it all away or trying to get it all in that sense, but just having a much healthier, better relationship with it all. And that's, yeah. That's really great. Thanks. So good. I have one last very important statement to make, and I, I didn't leave enough time at the end here for it, but it's okay. Cause it's really just sort of a, an interesting idea. So I mentioned at the very beginning that we should be kind of thinking this whole time, why would God or this really major God need to ask the Buddha anything? And the thing about it is, and I realize now that I kind of opened this up earlier, but then I closed it totally down. And what it is, is, is that it's when I was talking about like, should uh, do we believe in Indra or do we not believe in Indra and all of that? So a big question or not a question, but uh, an idea that gets floated about. It's the question of whether Buddhism is atheistic. And Buddhism has a very interesting relationship to God or the gods. It would not be kind of totally accurate to say that Buddhism is atheistic because there's a lot of theos. <laughs> there's a lot of gods in Buddhism. So you cannot say that they don't have a understanding of God. However, ah, this is why I left out a whole portion of tonight. I apologize about that. So the sutta that we read from the Samyutta Nikaya is called the Saka Panha Sutta, the questions of Saka. In the Diga Nikaya, the long discourses of the Buddha, what I call the Buddha's greatest hits, in here, there is also, I think it's sutta number, sutta, sutta number 21, is also the Sakapanha Sutta. It's also the questions of, sak of Chakra. And in this, this is a much longer sutra. It's in the long discourses, but it has this really long introduction about how Chakra, he wants to go ask the Buddha a question, but he's intimidated by the Buddha. And so Chakra gets a Gandhara, a flute playing Gandharava to go first and basically like warm the Buddha up and then Chakra is going to go. My point is, 
it's a very narrativized understanding of God or the gods. So my my point is, is that although the gods are in the Buddhist tradition, they don't exactly believe in them. They're kind of much more part of the literary tradition, if you will. They're figurative. But that brings me to my main kind of rhetorical question. What does it mean to say that the God of desire goes and asks the Buddha a question? And ultimately what it's saying, and this is the message of Buddhism, by the way, a Buddha, which is to say a being in nirvana, which is achievable in this very life, we've heard about it, a being that is in nirvana is more powerful and transcends the gods. And so the gods come and ask the Buddha questions because the Buddha is in a way superior to them. That is a whole other kind of religion. When we are not worshiping God, but God is worshiping the achieved human. That's a wild kind of reframing of religion. And it's one of the reasons why I personally really like Buddhism because of that relationship with divinity or, or deities in that way. So, all right. That was a very long-winded way of saying, or uh, speaking about this unique status of a Buddha. So, all right, everybody. I'm going to call it a night, I'm a little over, but thanks for being here, everybody. My pleasure as always. And I'll see you next week. Do another sutra.